All right, everybody. That should be working okay. I gotta get that where it's supposed to be. All right, well, hopefully everybody can see and hear. All right, we've got, there we go. <clears throat> Pardon me. We've got a watch party going. It is Monday, April 13th. Welcome into the Monday edition of COPD Navigator House Call. My name is Mike Hess. <clears throat> As you can see, the allergy seasons are kind of firing up a little bit right now. Uh, ironically, I am a respiratory therapist. I am a COPD advocate, educator, um, navigator, lots of different hats in the COPD world. <clears throat> Excuse me. My favorite hat to wear is administrator of the COPD Navigator Facebook group, uh, which has grown uh, into a YouTube channel and a Twitter feed and all kinds of fun stuff now. Uh, I am now able to check in with you uh, through the magic of technology, maybe. If he looks maybe a little bit choppy, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But checking in with you uh, from the sick bay of the original Star Trek or Starship Enterprise, as Mr. Scott would say, no bloody A, B, C, or D. Um, this is something fun I wanted to experiment with. We'll have to see how it goes. Uh, thanks, Michael Roth, for checking in today. Appreciate you. I know you're having uh, in the thick of things out west. Mike is one of my fellow respiratory therapists, so I appreciate you taking the time to uh, see how things are going. Hope everything is going okay in your neck of the woods. Um, we're, we'll see how it goes here. I don't know how choppy the video is going to get. We might have to go back to uh, the old school or, or let you peek behind the curtain a little bit at the old green screen here. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But otherwise, uh, this is a great time for, as I was saying, this is a great time for you to get your COPD questions answered. I know uh, in the middle of this novel coronavirus pandemic, um, we are having a lot of issues getting people connected with the resources and information they need in order to best uh, take care of their, uh, their condition. Uh, we know that caregivers are having trouble. We know that everybody's having an issue. There's a lot of confusion going on out there. So hopefully uh, we can do our part to uh, uh, minimize some of that and at least get you some best practice information. Of course, we can't do any kind of official medical advice or anything like that. But what I can do is give you uh, best practice advisories and all that kind of fun stuff. So uh, Linda checking in says some having a hard time. Um, I'm guessing that we're talking about uh, some folks right now having a hard time with um, allergies, things like that. Um, if you can tell me if you're having a hard time seeing, like I said, th this this new high tech background comes at a cost of adding processor load. So uh, the biggest uh, the biggest important thing is getting you the information. So if we can have some fun, let's have some fun. If not, I want to get back to the, the regular stuff here. So. Uh, also, good day to James and good day to Gabby, checking in uh, both from out west, Idaho and Oregon. Uh, appreciate everybody again taking some time today. Um, the, the question came up last week. There are some people who see uh, questions in different parts of uh, or who aren't seeing all the questions that come through. There are because of the the complexities and all that stuff of Facebook. We've got two main sources. Um, we can see things, uh, so having some trouble with the video, so I was afraid of that. Had, to, had a little fun with it, but maybe we'll go back to, uh, um, getting the regular camera going here in just a second. <clears throat> uh, in any event, um, we've got two, uh, main question feeds coming in, so, um, I'm going to pause for just a second, and, um, Gonna fix the background a little bit. We had our fun. We're gonna get back to back to business here. So bear with me for just one second.
All right. So we'll play around. All, All right. right. Hopefully, Hopefully that, that will fix things, things a little, little bit. bit. Oh. Behind the high tech, tech doings of Mucophile Studio as a title. We'll, we'll get back to our, our regularly uh, planned adventures uh, tomorrow. We're going to do one more thing real quick here. And we're just going to. There we go. Now things are looking, looking a little bit more close to where, where they are. are so. so. We had, we had, we had some, some fun there, there. Uh, maybe, maybe not, not quite working out with the streaming as well as I would, I would hope, but, but always room for some experimentation and playing around a little bit. We'll see, we'll see how, how it goes, maybe we can get some stuff uh, together in the future and see if uh, we can make, make it work, because that was fun. But, but back to the business, business at hand. Uh, uh, we, we are talking COPD, we are talking coronavirus, we are live on Twitter. We, we are live on Facebook, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we've, we've got all kinds of different ways to get your uh, questions in here, here, so please go ahead and get those in. Um, while we are waiting here, um, share, share a couple of things with you for those, again, again, for those of you in the uh, Michigan, the great state of Michigan, the Wolverine State. Um, right now we are talking about uh, common formulary stuff. Oh, I'm looking on Twitter, that's kind of a weird thing here going on. I don't even know what that's all about. Huh. Weird. Weird. Anyway, maybe we'll, we'll try, try and, uh, uh, oh, audio issue. issue. So, that's what happens when I try and do cool stuff. <laughs> Uh, okay, that should have fixed the audio. Um, when, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a peek behind the scenes of the tech stuff. Sometimes when you switch the media in, the uh, microphone from the camera also picks up alongside the microphone from the microphone. My nice fancy microphone here. Uh, and that gives us double audio, which is no fun whatsoever. And um, judging by the commentary... I'm going to be hearing about that for the rest of the week uh, with my family. So hopefully um, the audio should be corrected. I think we're getting some. All right. So I was going to say, I think we're getting some uh, delay here. That's another uh, peek behind the, uh, you guys are getting all kinds of behind the scenes background today. There is about a, I never actually timed it, about a five second delay or so between um, what I see and um, what I see on the feed from the feed. Oh, that's a weird thing happening. I don't know. It is what it is. Apparently, I just need to stop overthinking myself and just go back to good old-fashioned COPD Navigator Live. In any event, we are here. We are uh, mostly here. Got a couple people checking in with uh, comments on um, the main feed. We got some comments in the watch party. If you happen to be on Facebook, you're welcome to come. Um, uh
So, uh, like I said, we've got the watch party going. We've got the main feed going. If you're not seeing all the questions, you are welcome to join in one or the other. Again, we've also got some questions coming in from YouTube. Uh, might even get a tweet here and there, so we'll see what happens. Um, let's see. Hopefully, we can get this all figured out. I had some adjustments because I had the green screen going, and I moved the camera around a little bit, and it is totally a Monday in here. So... Uh, hello, Joe. Hello, uh, Bonnie. Uh, loop back through here a little bit. Um, hope everybody's having a great day here in Michigan. It is windier than all get out outside. Um, I would love to try to blame some of my uh, tech issues on the wind, um, but I can't, so I won't. And that's the way it is. So, as I was saying, here in Michigan, where it is windier than heck outside, this is common formulary season for the asthma COPD end of things. Um, if you happen to be on somebody, or if you happen to be somebody, you know somebody, care for somebody uh, who happens to participate in one of our Medicaid plans here in Michigan, um, this is the time for you to voice your opinion on whether you think the common formulary is good enough or not. And spoiler alert, it is not, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. So um, I'm gonna drop a uh, um, I'm gonna drop an address, an email address in the uh, um, actually I'm gonna drop a whole web address in the comments of both the watch party and the question feed. Um, just as soon as I remember how to search for it. So here we go. Um, this is the website for the um, Medicaid Common Formulary Benefit here in Michigan. And if you're not in Michigan and couldn't care less, I apologize. But this is something, of course, near and dear to my heart because this is where I live and where I care for people. So we're going to drop that there in those various spots, hopefully. That at least is working. Um, so we can email, you can call, you can, there's a couple of different ways you can get your voice heard. Um, this is definitely something that, uh, we need to do to make sure that everybody is getting the tools they need once they have access to the tools they need. Um, and I hope that we can actually start making a difference. I'm told, um, you know, um, I, I try not to get too soapboxy. And again, I know a lot of people have heard this ad nauseum over and over again, but, we th this this crisis has revealed some of the shortcomings that we've tried to hide in our healthcare system for a while, and um, I think the the aftermath of all this is going to give us a good chance to do some some quality improvement stuff, and maybe we can start you know now that people are starting to think about their breathing a little bit more, maybe we can make a little bit more headway. Um, teaching legislators and policymakers that there are different kinds of inhaled medications, that there are different kinds of therapies available, that we need to start looking at this more as um, a public health issue rather than, ah, it's just a bunch of smokers who really care. So I'm hopeful that we can really make some, some headway into that. I know we've got a lot of, I've been reading more and more um, as we get further and further into the treatment, and we do have a lot of people recovering from this. I'm seeing that there's a tremendous need uh, and a, tr a tremendous additional need for um, pulmonary rehab, um, neurological rehab, um, I would imagine there's there's going to be some call for cardiac rehab for a while. You know, all these things are going to be working together, and it's going to uh, beho behoove a lot of us in the um, uh, respiratory, COPD, asthma, pulmonary communities to work together to make sure these things happen. That's why today's shirt not only um, is to go along with the theme of being inside the, uh, well, for a minute anyway, being inside sick bay. Um, I find your la lack of logic disturbing. Um, I recorded the raw audio for my next podcast episode where we talk a lot about um, confounding factors in research. And along those lines, I think we've got to really start looking at how we're integrating logic and science and all of these evidence-based guidelines and things like that into our healthcare system, particularly when it comes to something like COPD. So um, I'm hopeful that we can we can go ahead and get that going and um, we'll see what happens. So, um, But what is on your mind today? Again, this is kind of a, a weird new normal situation that... Um, that we're in the middle of still trying to adapt to what things are going to be like over the next week, two weeks, two months, two years. Um, 
um, looking to see what else. Uh, the the biggest news in the COPD community is probably that uh, we talked a little bit about this on Friday. Um, Medicare, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, has removed non-invasive ventilators from their um, from their competitive billing program, which is um, excellent news. We have a lot of people who are showing very good progress from that, and the last thing we wanted to do was to um, make it harder for them to access these, these medications and stuff. So, um, hopefully we can, we can keep that going. Uh, as we've mentioned a couple of other times, um, we have really had some trouble with, um, getting COPD research right now because in the middle of a pandemic, there aren't a lot of things being published outside the elephant in the room. Um, so it is what it is. I'm, I'm scrolling through. I'm looking through right now just to try to get some, see if we have any new updates or anything like that. But uh, my main, one of my main sources has nothing. Ah, here's something interesting um, through the VA. Oh, we got a couple of interesting things coming up in the community here. So let's take a dive through some of the latest um, information here. Now, what has... What has been a controversial topic in respiratory for a little while now is trying to is do um, patient education programs work? Um, you know, programs that teach people how to disease, manage their condition better, their their symptoms, all that kind of thing. There has been some oops. There's been some weird conflicting information about a lot of these things over the years, um, including one of the hallmark studies that actually came out of the Department of Veterans Affairs a few years back where they actually had to stop the study early because um, people were, were dying at a faster rate in the intervention group getting the information they needed than they were in the control group where they were just doing whatever had been done before. So it's been a really interesting point of discussion for quite a while now about how, what do we do? What, what should we do to manage COPD more effectively? Because, you know, I was just saying we, we've got to bring more logic and science into it. Well, the science is conflicting. So a new study that is out now says individualized telephone outreach reduces COPD exacerbation. So, um, <laughs> and I'm laughing because this, um, this study was led by Dr. McCoy. <laughs> um, uh, Tammy McCoy, doctor of nursing practice. So uh, Dr. Tammy McCoy and her team at um, a rural outpatient clinic in East Liverpool, Ohio, um, grabbed 10 veterans. So this was a fairly small study. Um, they got a flu vaccine, they got a pneumonia vaccine, and then they had individualized proactive healthcare visits by telephone each week for six weeks. Um, during the outreach intervention, none of the veterans required emergency care. Well, okay, that's good. That's six weeks. Um, this provided a stark contrast in the same period a year ago when, uh, when the 10 veterans, uh, used VA medical emergency care resources six times in six weeks. So, um, I'm going to see what I'm going to have to do is see if I can find the actual published paper on this because I'm a little bit confused as to whether they randomly selected these 10 and then went back and looked at their, their previous studies. That's the way this is kind of reading or exactly what they did with that. So um, the claim is at least for these 10 folks, they were able to reduce their healthcare utilization. They didn't have a flare during the six weeks. They, it was um, their clinic visits dropped from eight to four. They made fewer calls to the clinic, which probably makes sense since they're getting a regular call every week. Um, so the the relevance of this, you know, with, with the caveat that this was a very small sample size, very preliminary study, the importance of this is saying that. If you have remote communication, like what we're we're doing a one-sided version of that right now, but if we were able to have two-sided communication, uh, video conferencing, telephone conferencing, virtual visits sometimes they're called, if we're able to do that, we might be able to reduce the number of flares because we're having that, that coordinated check-in, maybe not quite as resource intensive. We're not dragging people in every week, but we're having that touch point where we're saying, hey, how are your symptoms doing? Are you aware of your symptoms? 
okay, we've got some weather coming in. Make sure that you're you're being cautious when you go outside because it's going to be hot in the next few days. Or we've got make sure you got taking your allergy medicine. You can kind of do those fine tuning things remotely without tying up a lot of everybody's schedule. Um, arguably, it's still on the, on the provider side of things, but. Um, we can we can have a little bit more fine tuning, and as a matter of fact, one of the uh, um, the highlights was saying where to go. I just saw. Oh shoot, where to go? I just said that one of the biggest. Uh, um, pl- oh, they felt their care was personalized. They felt empowered. We're making the patient happy, and we're freeing those resources from all, for other veterans. Not only that, but when we have a situation like we're, what we have now, where here in Michigan we're under a stay-at-home order for the next uh, two weeks at least, um, similar situations all across the country, we're having a lot of, um, we have to be very cautious when we have people who have maybe bad immune systems, like anybody with a chronic condition, when we're exposing them to a waiting room in a, in a hospital, in a clinic, in an urgent care place. So these telehealth things, the more, inf- the more evidence we can get that telehealth and telemedicine actually works, the easier it's going to be to do a lot of this stuff efficiently. Uh, I, of course, have have been a huge proponent of telehealth for a while. Um, I have run this group on Facebook for, um, what, five years now, something like that, maybe even six years now. Um, the, the, the idea of tele, telehealth, telelearning even hits a lot of concepts of adult learning. It doesn't have to happen at the same time. You can be like, uh, Joe who's asking me a question here that I can't respond right this second, but I'm going to get to, um, momentarily. Um, also thank you for checking in on YouTube. Don't have, I'm trying to build that audience too. So thank you very much. Um, we can, as, as we're doing these things, if you if you watch my usual show, um, Breathe TV, that, that we usually do every other Wednesday, um, I can have graphics, I can have charts, I can have all kinds of fun stuff that um, maybe you learn better not from listening to this lecture here, but you learn better by watching a video or by watching an animation or something like that. With telehealth, we can do a lot of that stuff even easier than what we can do in the office sometimes. So telehealth ticks a lot of boxes for um, good quality care, good quality learning, um, which helps people manage their stuff more effectively. I don't care what the conflicting data is. You will never convince me that you don't do it better the more you know. So um, that's that soapbox for right now. And we've got some other interesting stuff coming through, but I do want to get to Joe. Um, thanks again for checking in, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, Joe asks, does more mucus mean more inflammation? Um, sometimes it does. It's not necessarily a hard and fast indicator. Um, you know, we there they've been searching for many years to kind of find this holy grail of what does mucus tell us? You know, there are charts out there that tell us, well, if it's if it's this color, then it means one thing. If it's that, it, who knows? Um but because there's so much individual variation in how much you produce, oftentimes I would say it does mean more inflammation because one of the things, kind of what the pathway is, the more irritated your lungs get, the more they inflame. And then if you've ever had, um, you ever had like sunburn or if you've ever, you know, like wiped out on a bicycle and you've, you've had a big abrasion, you've had a big scratch across your hand or something like that, um, you know that it tends to get kind of dry. When that happens inside your body, your body produces its own natural lubricant, which inside the respiratory tract is some thickness of mucus. Sometimes it's very thin, sometimes it gets thicker. Again, a lot of variables there. So when you have that irritation, you tend to produce a little bit more of that. Um, Is it necessarily an active indicator i can't really say that's true because we look at some other biomarkers like eosinophil count or um exhaled nitric oxide we have some other measures that are more precise to tell us that tissue is inflamed so um 
we tend to rely on those a little bit more. In the absence of those, I would say a general rule of thumb is that the more mucus you're, provo- you're producing, the more inflamed you are. Um, I tend to use that as kind of, a, you know, again, kind of a rule of thumb for when we're looking at some of the anti-inflammatory meds that are out there, particularly uh, reflumolast. The, uh, um, now the biggest, uh, probably the, the most prevalent uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory that we have out there for COPD, or whether we're considering putting somebody on azithromycin. Now, of course, that also has the antibiotic side of things, so, which can cause more secretions, more mucus, all that stuff, but also has anti-inflammatory characteristics. I tend to look at those folks who um, are producing more junk um, as kind of a marker of inflammation. I wouldn't necessarily stake my license on it, but it can be a handy rule of thumb. So the the answer, the short answer is yes with a but. <laughs> or yes with a maybe or however we want to look at that. Um, it also, you know, there, there are also other things that can produce more mucus. You know, it's not necessarily just, just inflammation. So again, that's why it's, we don't necessarily want to draw that straight line connecting the two. A uh, quick shout out to Jan. Uh, Janice, thank you for checking in. Another um, COPD advocacy captain. Uh, appreciate you stopping by on this Monday. Um, let's see, want to circle back around to the group. I keep mentioning if you are not a member, you are um, always welcome to join us. Of course, in um, COPD Navigator, the group, um, COPD Navigator, the page, COPD Navigator, the YouTube channel. Now I'm starting to feel like another one of my favorite uh, um, uh, sci-fi movie, Spaceballs. Um, we've got a lot of different channels for you to, to join us, so I invite everybody to, uh, to come in here. So I want to check out this other article that I came across that um, I see now is on two different, two different sites. So um, we're going to see what – I'm going to go with the one that is – let's see, I can either go with Genetic Engineering and Biotech News or with Sci-News.com. So – my guess would be sci- sciencenews.com is probably um, a thing that more people would have access to. So this might give us a good opportunity to kind of give us an idea of whether it is a useful source or not. So uh, according to a new study published in the European Respiratory Journal, which is good, smokers and individuals with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease have higher levels of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. Uh, which is the entry receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, which is the coronavirus that we're talking about all the time right now. This may explain the increased risk of severe COVID-19, which is the disease that comes from coronavirus. You hear a lot of these words interchangeably, and they're not entirely interchangeable. So I try and clarify a lot of that stuff uh, whenever I can. Um... So what we're seeing, so what this is saying, uh, oh, this may increase, may explain the increased risk of severe COVID-19 in these subpopulations and highlight the importance of smoking cessation. So what we're looking at here is in the lung of the person with COPD, particularly those who are active cigarette smokers, we have... um, an increased presence, we find an increased presence of this particular enzyme um, that the novel coronavirus, SARS-2, um, whatever that is, um, seems to really like. So it's attracted to that, and one would think that that would also increase the risk of you getting it in the first place. However, we talked last week about the fact that people with asthma and COPD are a little bit underrepresented in a lot of the the COVID-19 population. So my pet theory was that you all are taking the um, quarantine seriously and physically isolating yourselves, which is good. Um, This would seem to also support that to a certain degree because you're certainly more likely to get um, more severe COVID-19 because of these higher levels. Um, Checks against two other study groups. Um, So yeah, 
I think, uh, again, this is very preliminary. This is something I haven't, I didn't actually dig into the journal article itself. So um, that's gonna, I'm gonna be putting that on my list for sure. Um, but this does seem to, to, to explain why um, you are more likely to get more severe COP or more severe COVID-19 disease if you are a smoker or um, especially an active smoker or if you have the high levels of this ACE2 um, enzyme in your lung. Uh, it would also send, seem to lend some credence to the idea that because people may be taking it a little bit more seriously, if you have uh, COPD or if you have asthma or if you have both, um, that might explain why you're underrepresented. So Interesting news. It'll be interesting to see how some of that pans out here. Just out of curiosity, let's take a look and see what genetic engineering and biotech had to say about it. Um, and let's see. This is uh, covering the same article. Uh, no, I don't want to register now. Um, yes. Okay. Ad blocker, whatever. Um. SARS-CoV-2 uses to gain entry into host cells and cause infection. Uh, people with COPD and people who are still smoking have higher levels of this in their airways. Um, so the good thing is once you quit, you get back down to the never smoker level. So as I always tell people, it is never too early to quit and it is never too late to quit. Um, I know it's easy to say, and believe me, I know that uh, we shouldn't just be so cavalier about it. I'm not trying to be cavalier about it. I'm just, uh, this is my, my encouragement that we can always uh, help people and, and do better. Uh, this suggests there's never been a better time to quit smoking than to protect yourself from COVID-19, and patients with COPD should be counseled to strictly abide by social distancing and proper hand hygiene to prevent infection. So that leads to um, a couple of other topics that have popped up a lot recently. Um, first off, you know, in Michigan, they extended our stay-at-home order for an extra two weeks, and there has been this huge outcry. Um, oddly enough, people are mad that they can't plant things, which if you've ever been in Michigan in the first half of April, you should know that you really shouldn't want to plant anything unless you want to buy it again in a couple of weeks because there is a very good chance we're still going to have a hard freeze as a matter of fact um, as a matter of fact right now in michigan uh in at our in our neck of the woods because yes i am geeky enough to have my own little weather station um outside right now it is 40 degrees um, now, again, I know that I realize that's not a hard frost or anything like that, but um, let me see if I can scroll down to the forecast real quick here. Uh, oh, come on. Internet is running a little slow, which helps uh, explain some of the tech issues. So tonight we're going to get down to 30 degrees. Tomorrow night we're getting down to 28 degrees. Who in their right mind is planting stuff right now? I get that people are frustrated. I get that people are um, cooped up and all that stuff. But of all the things that are to complain about, that one is really irritating. And as Sean mentions, also, you can get, you can still get stuff at smaller stores if you actually read the order. Um, it is very specific about what areas are to be penned off. You know, we have a lot of superstores. We have Walmart super centers. We have Meyer, which was kind of the original one-stop shop. Um, those stores are massive. So if you have stores that are over like 50,000 square feet, they have to rope off some of that and they can't necessarily sell it. But if you go to a Lowe's, a Home Depot, a Menards, you can actually even order stuff ahead of time and they'll bring it out to your car. So, um, a lot of it is just complaining for no good. And I bring all this stuff up not to complain about those people, but to reinforce that if you have these chronic conditions, you should be keeping your distance. If you know or ever come into contact with somebody who has these issues, you should also be protecting yourself because the last thing you want to do is be an asymptomatic transmitter of this disease to somebody you, you care about. And there are a lot of cases uh, where people have had no symptoms and have still relayed this to somebody else. So please be mindful of that. The other thing that um, I wanted to talk about was um, hand hygiene. 
there's been uh, there was a discussion a couple of days ago uh, in in our group about whether you should wear gloves when you go to the grocery store because that is a thing that we talk about a lot. And in theory, and I want to really emphasize and put quotation marks and italics and all that kind of stuff on in theory, gloves can help reduce the risk of disease transmission. That's why we wear them in the hospital. That's why, you know, we expect food service people to do that kind of thing. But particularly in the hospital, we don't only rely on, on gloves. We also, anytime you go in, any, anytime you have somebody, if you're, if you're in the hospital, anytime you come into, um, Anytime somebody comes into your room, they should be washing their hands or using hand sanitizer on their way in and on their way out because that's the, the ha, excuse me, having a barrier is great, but you also need to do the cleanliness. Now, where am I going with this as far as going to the grocery store? The reason we wash on the way in and on, and on the way out is because we want to make doubly sure that we're clean each time we go between cases. In this, in this particular example, it's between people. In the grocery store, it would be between items you touch. So let's say you're going down an aisle and you pick up a box of cereal. That's great. You put it in the cart. Now, realistically, in order to really prevent the spread of transmission before you touch your cart handle before you touch your cell phone before you touch your nose to scratch it you should remove your gloves and wash your hands and put on a new set of gloves that i'm sure i don't have to tell you is wildly impractical for shopping so the key is to again continue to clean keep your hands clean um it doesn't you again you don't necessarily have to sanitize between touching each thing but before you touch your face, certainly you're going to want to make sure that you've got some hand sanitizer going at least, you know, ideally it would be soap and water, but at least if you're doing the 60% hand sanitizer, that gets the job done well enough. So don't necessarily get caught up in wearing um, um, gloves. Masks are a slightly different issue. You know, we're seeing a lot of, of discussion about when should you wear a mask? Should you wear a mask all the time? Should you wear some kind of face covering? The idea with the mask is that you are preventing your contaminants from going out to other people. And again, we mentioned that there's a lot of evidence that people can be asymptomatic and still transmit the disease because sometimes it's two weeks before you know you're sick. So it's kind of a good idea. I mean, ideally, but again, we've got to make sure that you're trying to wear stuff properly. I have seen a lot of surgical masks worn improperly lately. What really bothers me is when I see clinical grade N95 masks being worn improperly because I know that that's just a waste that some of my colleagues who are in the hospital, it's putting them at risk. That's irritating. Wear the mask properly. Make sure you have as much seal as you can. Um, if you have a homemade thing, again, that, that don't expect it to protect you from everybody else, it's protecting them from you, honestly. Go with it, go into it with that philosophy, and it's going to be okay. Again, the key thing is going to be hand washing. Um, there are a lot of recommendations because, as, as uh, Sean also points out, uh, Sean, by the way, a fantastic nurse practitioner, so I appreciate her, her bringing some advice and another perspective in here. Um, can live on shoes for seven days. I mean, this stuff is, is, is we're, we're seeing there's some, some talk it can live on cardboard boxes. So should you be wiping your groceries down? Again, I don't know that I necessarily jump into a lot of that stuff as long as you are keeping your hands clean and keeping your counters clean and all that kind of stuff. So caution, more caution than usual. Even I would say, don't, you know, don't, don't just do business as usual and all that stuff. Be extra village diligent. Diligent and vigilant is how that all came out. Um, yep, yeah, so it is right about five seconds. You're very welcome, Sean. Um, so in, in any event, be cautious, be diligent, uh, be vigilant, do all those things. But don't get caught up in wearing every single layer of protective garb that you can manage because it's probably put to better use somewhere else, honestly. <laughs> Uh, so that was a fun little tangent there. So, um, let's see. 
Okay, it stops. Okay, you can get stuff at the smaller stores. Can't get paint and seeds. And you know, honestly, I I, I didn't. I went to Meyer over the weekend because we were we were running out of groceries again. I had to get some, so I went first thing in the morning, um, where risk of contamination was low. Right when it opened, there were few pe- fewer people in the store. Everything has ostensibly been sanitized and all that stuff. Um, actually, I had to go down buy hardware looking for a uh, uh, something. And they had a sign up that said, sorry, you're going to have to wait for the finishing touch. Um, Can't sell paint right now. I don't know if they locked it out of the computer or what, but I mean, there wasn't anything physically stopping me from picking up the can of paint and going out there. A lot of this stuff is really trying to reinforce the sense of community i mean no cops aren't going to pull you over for going out somewhere unless you're doing something else wrong and then it's kind of an add-on to that but it's important enough it's trying to emphasize that this is important enough to take seriously i mean the idea isn't to do it to avoid the ticket. It's to do it to avoid making somebody you care about sick. So a lot of these groups that are pushing for opening right away and too much as quarantine is enough and talking about fascism and all that stuff, it's just it's getting a little bit out of hand, especially from somebody on the clinical side of things who has a lot of people that I feel that I want to protect. Um, take this stuff seriously, please. Um, so... Uh, that probably drove away a whole bunch of people, but that's all right. Uh, strongly held beliefs. <laughs> um, also saying hello to a Mr. Thomas Hess checking in from the upstairs. Also following on YouTube. Appreciate you checking by. Um, any other COPD questions we got? Uh, probably about another 10 minutes or so. We're going to see what else we've got going on here. Um, oh, don't want to forget, uh, I also saw a wave from Gene, Gene Gant from down from Tennessee, uh, another fantastic respiratory therapist. We've got a good group of clinicians and um, people living in the COPD community. So if there was ever a time for one of you to ask questions to the other, I say all the time I've learned more from being a group leader um, and be having that engagement with the people that uh, are I'm involved with than I ever learned in school or any of that stuff. So um, get those questions in as we speak. Um, also looking at, uh, so here's a, here's a thought I have, and I'm, I'll probably, I'll get an announcement out on the uh, um, the actual page um, later today or tomorrow when I, when I firm up what the schedule is going to be. But I'm looking at probably 7 Eastern time, uh, Wednesday or Thursday, doing an actual interactive thing. I set up uh, one of these Zoom conferences, which is where I got the idea for trying to do the background thing. Uh, we'll set up a Zoom conference where we can actually have verbal and visual as much as you want interaction. You don't have to have a webcam. You don't have to do any of that stuff. But if you want to, I, I, and I'll have it open, you know, I'll have it restricted so that, you know, and not that there's been a lot of Zoom bombing, I guess it's called. Um, I don't want people to be inappropriate or anything like that. So we'll have some restrictions on it, but I'll post a link um, and we'll see if we can get some kind of interaction thing going. We can have a little bit more demonstration kind of stuff see if that might actually work and just out of curiosity we're trying some new things um taking advantage of our, our time to experiment here a little bit glenn checking in from the down south uh, appreciate you stopping by so uh sean asks uh from the clinical site if money was no object what is the easiest copd med to use um It depends. Uh, The easiest one to use is probably a nebulizer. There's no technique involved. You basically sit there and you, um, those of you who unlikely in this group, I know, but for those of you who have perhaps never seen a nebulizer before, a nebulizer looks it looks generally like this there are of course a couple of different models out there uh, but a nebulizer looks like this and the technique to use a nebulizer is this (laughs) 
You don't really have to use a particular breathing technique. You don't have to use particular coordination. You don't have to have a particular inspiratory flow. Um, so the easiest thing to use is this. Does that make it the best thing to use, though? And that's really the question. Whoops. That's always the question that we have to face um, on the clinical side of things is while something might be easiest, is it the best? Um, somebody, you know, there are there are more limited choices in nebulized medication. So somebody might not respond particularly well to the options that are available. So we might have to spend a little bit more time in doing the training and all that kind of stuff to make sure that they have the best possible um, technique and best possible outcomes. Um, you know, the, the, the nebulizer itself, while, oops, while these days is fairly portable, uh, this is an example of one that I was able to get with uh, my flex spending money. Um, as, as an exemplar, ex exemplar, example, whatever. Um, this is generally speaking fairly portable, but it still has to be plugged in. So if I were to need albuterol for a reliever medication, I would have to either stay very close within six feet or so, the measurement of the month um, of a power outlet, or I'd have to spend double my money and get a battery for this, um, which in many cases is not practical. You know, a lot of the people on in my panel are on very fixed incomes and can barely afford the medications that we can prescribe for them. Um, so it's not always the best option, but... Um, it is an option. It's a, I guess what I guess what it comes down to is the easiest thing isn't always the best thing. And if if well if there is a life philosophy, if I've ever heard one, there you go. Um, the easiest thing isn't always the best. The best isn't always the easiest. So that's what makes it so important for all of us on the clinical side of things to make sure that we are uh, completely evaluating our patients' needs, um, and to make sure that um, we're matching them as best as we can. Um, I also want to throw, uh, let's see, Joe um, wanted to share that Right to Breathe, which uh, for those of you who don't know Joe Morrison, Joe is a fantastic COPD advocate, um, one of the, the best in the game, and he has created, uh, he has a, a very personal connection to COPD, uh, and he's also a drag racer. Not in the RuPaul sense, but in the actual vehicle uh, drag racing sense. I was actually lucky enough to, to see him go a couple of years ago, um, and that was really cool. So um, he is a uh, drag race aficionado, um, and he they Right to Breathe is their organization that has done field testing for um, uh, field spirometry testing, has served as an inspiration for some of the things we did through our, our NIH uh, project a couple year, or, uh, yeah, a couple years ago now. Um, we does incredible, incredible work. I know I use that word a lot, but truly incredible work. Um, awesome in every sense of the word, um, for awareness stuff on uh, tomorrow. They are doing their video chats, uh, one at, uh, four 30 Eastern and another at 7 PM Eastern. So I might have to, uh, try and, uh, uh try and change up my programming a little bit. Maybe I, cause I don't, I definitely don't want to conflict with that. I want people to get all the COPD information they can, uh, particularly with, um, Jim and Mary Nelson, who, um, if you were around last week, you know, they stopped by a couple of times. Jim is, uh, another COPD advocate and a person with COPD himself, um, actually a recipient of a double lung transplant a number of years ago and has used his, uh, extended time to spread, uh, preach the gospel of COPD as it were. And his wife is a caregiver, hospice expert, all that kind of stuff. So I definitely don't want to uh, counter-program against the, uh, you never want to counter-program against the Nelsons if you have an opportunity. So um, I want to, uh, I will, uh, I'm going to get this flyer up on our main uh, navigator page and I encourage everybody to check that out um, tomorrow. So, and that, uh, Joe, are, are you doing that weekly now? Because I know that there was one uh, um, I heard from, um, from Michelle last week that uh, um, you guys did one last week. So is, is this going to be a weekly thing or uh, um, uh, curious to know um, 
you know, th this is a brave new world of telehealth and online engagement. So um, if we can all coordinate our efforts, I think we're going to be doing all right. So um, I appreciate you saying that I'm doing amazing stuff, too, because, uh, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and following in big footsteps. So, um, yes, uh, daughter checking in with Exemplar. Um, we're creating new words all the time here in the COPD universe here in Navigator Nation. So uh, Jan always uh, mentions while well, I'm waiting, uh, hopefully get a response from Joe here about whether this is weekly or not. Um, Jan does mention always carry that rescue inhaler. Um, I have uh, certainly don't disagree with the concept. I'm fumbling over my words here because um, I have kind of adapted a, a, a huge thing in the respiratory community over the last couple of weeks is the importance of words. Why the words we choose really makes a difference and why that sometimes is the, 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 the way we choose to communicate is sometimes more important than what we're communicating, I would argue. Um, you know, there's that whole thing about it's not what you said, it's how you said it. That's kind of kind of true right now, more so than ever, arguably. And where I'm going with this is frequently in, in North America in particular, we tend to call it a rescue inhaler, a short-acting bronchodilator, generally albuterol. And it has been my experience, certainly, and I know a lot of other people who people, a lot of other clinicians, people under our care are kind of reluctant sometimes to want to use that albuterol because they figure, well, I don't really need to be rescued right now. It's not that bad. I'm short of breath. I'm having symptoms. I just need to stop what I'm doing and and wait and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it really gets to be limiting sometimes. So I know over in Europe, or at least in the UK, uh, because I, I don't speak German or French, so I can't necessarily speak as well to that. But I know in the UK, they tend to call them reliever inhalers because you have these increased symptoms and you you need to get relief from those symptoms. So um, boy, I'm getting a lot of dropped frames and stuff here too. So that's a bummer. In any event. I just I, I, I don't want to at all go against what you definitely carry your um, short acting inhaler around your albuterol. Um, I just uh, use this opportunity. I tend to go with more along the lines of short acting reliever, those sort of things these days, because I do think words matter. And I don't want people to put off using their inhaler because they think that it's only for rescue. It's only for when things are really, really bad or anything like that. So uh, mini soapbox on that one. Um, so Joe says about every two weeks, kind of, all right, second and fourth Tuesday of the month for COPD, third Tuesday of the month for asthma going frequent, more frequently right now due to the current environment. I certainly understand that. Um, long time fans of, um, COPD navigator know that, um, about every other week or so lately, um, I've been doing a regular show, but I've been trying to hit, I've actually, uh, this is our sixth weekday in a row, I believe. I'm trying to hit every day at 4 PM to Eastern time to, um, you know, again, just kind of bring the message out there. So whatever we can do to help is uh, fantastic stuff. And um, we're going to keep on working together to make that happen. Um, so because um, because tomorrow they're going on at 4.30, um, I think maybe we'll do a little bit earlier tomorrow because we, we've tried the early stuff. We've tried a little late, a little tried later stuff. We'll try hitting up uh, at three 30 or so. And then maybe we can be the, uh, the lead in to uh, the right to breathe network there. So um, I will definitely try to uh, push people over that way. So um, we will go ahead and start wrapping things up for today um, because I see the internet connection is still a little bit erratic right now. Uh, I appreciate everybody sticking through the blockiness, the low resolution, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, appreciate everybody keeping me on my toes today. Um, I'm going to loop through. Let's see. Do we have one more thing? Okay. So before I go away too much, we've got, I want to say hello to PC. Uh, hello to Tanya checking in from Battle Creek, not too far away from here. So hello, hello, Tanya. How often can you use the rescue inhaler in a day? So right along the topic of what we we're just talking about there. And 
Really, it's going to depend. Again, you know, all the, the disclaimers about this isn't truly medical advice, so you shouldn't go against your prescription or anything like that. Best practices, we don't generally uh, prescribe um, short-acting inhalers for use more than uh, for, for an inhaler. It would be two puffs every four hours. Um, there's always going to be some variation. Sometimes it's four to six hours. Sometimes it's four times a day. Sometimes it's every six hours, you know, just depending on where you're at and what your clinician prefers and all that stuff. Albuterol itself is designed to last for anywhere from three to six hours. It takes about, um, 10 minutes to kick in all the way, five minutes, something before you, maybe five minutes before you start getting effect, and then 10 minutes before you hit that peak effect. Then it's supposed to last for, depending on how, how your metabolism is, anywhere from like three to six hours. So we usually go every four just to make sure that you're getting coverage. It's also somewhat of a holdover from before we had effective controller medications or maintenance medications, uh, the long acting bronchodilators and that sort of thing. Um, so how often can you use it? You know, again, this kind of goes back to what Sean was saying about what's the, the easiest. How often can you use it? About every four hours. How often should you use it? That's really going to depend on what else is going on. Because in my practice, I tend to use how often you're using your rescue medication or there I go. It's a, it's a hard habit to break. Uh, how often you're using your reliever medication as kind of another measure as, uh, as far as whether we have you on the right control regimen, because ideally, um, ideally, and you know, again, perfect world stuff. If you're on the right control regimen, you really shouldn't have to use your reliever medication every day. Certainly not more than once or twice. Now, again, there's a lot of other factors involved there. A perfect world means you're not, you, you don't live in a place that has uh, irritants. So allergy counts are always low and there's never any pet dander or anything like that around or, you know, bugs or anything like that. Um, so I, I tell people to don't hesitate to use it, but also make sure that's not always your first go to either. Because another thing that we're not always good at in the clinical side of things is teaching you how to recognize the sim the signs that albuterol is going to be effective. Albuterol is a great drug. It is fantastic. It's one of the best drugs that's ever been created. But it's only good at one thing. It only works if the little muscles in your airways are clenched down, if you're in what's called bronchospasm. If that's not the cause of your shortness of breath, albuterol is not going to do a darn thing for you outside of any placebo effect. So if you're coughing because your inflammation is too high, you know, we talked about that a little bit before, not going to do anything. If you're short of breath because you've got air trapped in there, because, you know, again, with COPD, one of the things is you can't get the air out fast enough. If you've got air, air trapping, albuterol is not going to do a thing for you. You might do personal breathing or something like that. It's only going to help if you've got that bronchospasm. So, Again, it's kind of a measure. How often can you use it? How often should you use it? Are really two completely separate things. Um, and I would encourage anybody to work with their clinical team and to talk to them about how to recognize signs of bronchospasm and whether or not they're on the right uh, medication regimen and making sure that you know how to use your device. This has been a recurring theme through a lot of the, uh, the house calls in the last couple of weeks. But as it stands to reason, this device has a much different inhalation technique than this device, which has a much different inhalation technique than this device. They all look different. They all act different. And if we don't teach you how to use it, then you might not be using it properly. And you might not be getting the medication that you think you're getting. So, hopefully, that was some good information there. Uh, and yes, Joe, I would absolutely like to uh, see about joining in. So that'll uh, we'll we'll plan to uh, everybody plan to meet here again at three thirty Eastern time tomorrow. And I will definitely put another note out uh, for those of you who are subscribers, followers, all that stuff uh, on Facebook. Um, let us know or. Uh, um, 
Make sure you're sharing and liking and all that stuff that all the creators, all the influencers always say to do so that we can help get information out more readily uh, so that we can make all these COPD pages. Make sure you're heading over and liking and subscribing and all that stuff with Joe. Uh, right numeral to breathe and we'll get some links up there uh when i finish up this program um but yeah that's where we're gonna be uh we'll be here at 3 30 tomorrow so um i look forward to seeing everybody again um and get your questions in whether it is through our facebook page our youtube channel our facebook group um twitter at copd navigator um you may notice i did uh end up taking the website down today just because we're going to do a clean start on the whole thing but the email address still works so go ahead and hit us up um at breathe tv at copd navigator.net and um yeah so fantastic day hopefully tomorrow will be a little less windy hopefully tomorrow will be a little less buggy as far as the tech issues go uh, we didn't, like I said, we had a little bit of fun today, but, uh, it is what it is. Uh, a little bit, uh, I guess I need to get myself, um, one of those new gaming computers. Uh, oh, real quick before we go, Joe Walsh does ask any news on the albuterol shortage. So we're going to, let's see, American Society of Health, we're going to fire that up real quick. I haven't heard anything new. Um, I'm going to check out our, the, uh, um, Association, uh, oh, the American Society for Health System Pharmacists does a great job of highlighting um, drug shortages that are out there. They have not updated their thing since uh, March 24th as far as albuterol goes, so uh, likely still in a somewhat shortage situation. So uh, probably another reason to be careful about um how much you're using your albuterol and also a good reason to again if you live in michigan to check out that uh, email link to the uh, common formulary comment period because uh, there are certain brands that are not in shortage but we're still seeing issues that are requiring prior authorization which is just a pain in the you know where so let them know what's going on um adios joe you're very welcome tanya see you next time jim see you later janice uh, until tomorrow at 3 30 uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and keep breathing easy. Thank you very much for tuning in on Twitter. We'll see you tomorrow.